Um, hi, my name's my name's Ilanka Dunin. Can you hear me? Okay, in the back. Yes, right. Okay, they're not hearing me so well in the back. Can we uh, tweak the volume a little? So what Scott didn't tell you guys is the charity we raised seven hundred fifty-five dollars in here this Ooh, weekend. Nice. Which, if you guys realize that, of course, DragonCon doubles that. So. That's a big chunk that we put out into the charity for the Arthritis Foundation. So thank you guys for, for donating all this weekend. My knees feel better already. Okay. I see somebody with a Freemason hat. You were here yesterday, right? Yeah. Is it York right or Scottish right? Wow. Okay. All right. Well, welcome back. Okay. Should I go? Yep, okay. So uh, this is a new talk for me. This is my first time back at DragonCon in five years because of the pandemic. So I'm kind of catching up on some news and things that occurred in the crypto scene. And a couple things that happened were that some big codes were cracked or were found and, and were cracked. Uh, and the two that I'm going to be talking about today, we have the Zodiac Killer. He was a serial, serial killer in California. And also Mary Queen of Scots. Uh, dozens of letters of hers were found in the French National Library where they had been misfiled. And so they have now been decrypted, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. Uh, there's a funny story involving the Zodiac Killer. Uh, so this is my my latest book written with uh, Klaus Schmidt, uh, and it uh, we had the first edition of it that was released during the pandemic time. So it came out on December 10th, 2020. And uh, it has a lot of information on different codes in it and famous unsolved codes. And one of the famous unsolved codes that we covered was the Zodiac Killer. Famous unsolved code. Hadn't been solved in over 50 years. We figure it's never going to be cracked. So it was all through our book about. And there's unsolved codes like the Zodiac Killer code. So uh, that first edition came out December 10th, 2020. December 11th, 2020. <laughs> I get a call from one of our colleagues, David Aranchak, and he's telling me, um, we just solved Zodiac. You're going to have to rewrite the book. <laughs> and, you know, my first reaction was, okay, a lot of people say that they've solved unsolved codes. In fact, right now I'm, I've got somebody who's claiming they solved the doorbell of Cypher. I don't think they did it, but anyway, it, it, it happens all the time. So when he said he solved Zodiac, I'm like, did he really? I'm like, well, he's, he's pretty reputable. Maybe he did. And then it, what happens is you can't just say you've cracked a Cypher to get credit for it. You have to say you've cracked it. You have to say what it says, and then you have to say what the method is enough of the method that someone else, an independent third party, can then use that method in order to get the same result. This is basic scientific method. Can an independent laboratory get the same result that you did? And so he put the word out, and we were getting from everywhere saying, yeah, it's good, it's good, we got the same result. Like, wow, he really did it, and wow, we're going to have to rewrite the book. So, <laughs> so uh, Klaus and I, we'd already been thinking – when you do these kinds of books, it's like, oh, but I want to put this and I want to put this in. So the first version of the book we had, we had um, kind of pitched it to the publisher as a book about that thick that I'm holding here. Then when we were done with everything that we wanted to put in it, it was about that thick. And we're telling the public, and the public saying, nope, nope, that's not what we pitched to the distributor and to everybody. You're going to have to cut it down. We're like, what do you mean cut it down? And he said, well, you're going to have to get it down to what you pitch. We're like, but, 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 we've already written these chapters. And it's like, you know, killing your children. So we're like, yeah, tear that part out and eh, tear that part out. So when we were told we're going to have to rewrite the book, we're like, oh, we get to put all that stuff back in. So that's cool. So, um, so we rewrote the book and we put a bunch of stuff back in. And we also put in a bunch of new stuff that was coming in. And it is funny with unsolved codes. Klaus and I give talks about unsolved codes all the time. And whenever we give the talk, we have to check to make sure all of the codes are still unsolved because these codes get solved all the time. We're like, oh, this is solved. Okay, great. And so we rip that one out and we put in another one that's, that's unsolved because there's always new ones that are being discovered. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about the Zodiac Killer Cipher and how it was solved and who solved it and, and a bit of that story. And I'll be telling you about Mary Queen of Scots. So Zodiac Killer. 
messed up individual, a uh, serial killer in Northern California. Um, by the way, Klaus loves, loves doing these things with Legos. Um, <laughs> And it was in the late 1960s, a little bit in the early 1970s. Uh, there were several people that were killed. And what he would do, the, this killer, is he was also sending in these encrypted messages to newspapers and demanding that the newspapers publish these messages. Otherwise, he was going to go kill again. And we, we named these messages by the number of characters that were in that particular cipher. So we have the Z. 408, which had 408 characters in it, and, and so forth. So the, the first message that he did, which we called the, the 408, this one was released in 1969 and also solved in 1969. There was a husband and wife a teacher couple. Uh, he had an interesting code. She didn't, but she loved kind of puzzles and things. And together, they, they sat down over the kitchen table and they figured it out. And um, she had the, the intuitive spark that this serial killer was was probably full of ego and therefore the first word in the message was probably going to be I okay because of his ego and and they start and that sure enough was it and they solved it and it said I like killing and I'm not going to go into all of it but uh, into the messed up things that he was saying and it turned out to be what's called a homophonic cipher which means that for each letter there are multiple possible symbols that could be representing that letter. So here we have the homophonic table for that. And by the way, I never worked on the Zodiac Killer ciphers myself. And for a very specific reason, it's that when I'm working on a code, I really like to understand the context of the code. I like to understand who did it, and I like to crawl inside their head. And I did not want to crawl inside this guy's head. It just wasn't something that I wanted to do. But I'm aware of everything that was kind of going on around the, the study for the Zodiac Killer. And so then there's Z340 and remained unsolved for decades all kinds of fake solutions were coming up. Pretty much every year, two or three people would come up and they'd say, oh, I've solved it, and they hadn't solved it. There would even be some really kind of scummy documentary producers who would release a documentary and they'd say, and if you watch our documentary, we will tell you what the Zodiac message says because they claim that they discovered something new. They hadn't discovered anything new, but sometimes they would have one of these people who claimed they'd solved it and the documentary people would just kind of edit out everybody around them saying, no, you didn't solve it. And they would, and this, they'd still put it into the documentary. So anyway, it wasn't solved and it wasn't solved until late December, 2020 by a really intriguing trio of individuals, different continents. They did this over the internet without even meeting each other. So Dave Aranchak lives in Virginia and Sam Blake is in Australia and Jarl Van Eyke in Belgium. And generally what you'll have is you'll have different skill sets of the people that are doing this. They'll Maybe one person will be really into the history and the context of it. Another person will be really into creating the utilities that can be used to slice and dice it in different ways. And that was one of the things that Jarl did with his utility. And, and they were able to take it apart. So how do you solve it? Well, if you start at the top left-hand corner here, and then we're going to come down sort of like uh, the moves of a knight piece in chess, okay? And we're going to come down, down one over two, down one over two, all the way down, and then you're going to come back up to the top, right? It looks really easy once you know how it's put together, <laughs> but you do it that way, and that's where these these different characters are. And again, you would have a homophonic system. This was, and this was the homophonic substitution table. And they uh, solved it. And again, it started with I. And I hope you are having lots of fun in trying to catch me. And then on and on, which again, I'm not going to read because I just find him very disturbed. Um, so after Z340, that leaves two other messages that he has done that are not yet solved. We call these the Z32 and the Z13. Now, some people claim that these will never be solved because they're too short. There's something called the unicity distance, which is that if something is really, really short, you cannot have a unique solution. There's too many solutions that can be generated for that. And 
so you won't know if it's the intended solution or not. Uh, some people say that, well, Z13, yeah, we're going to say it really is saying Alfred E. Newman. So if you're a fan of Mad Magazine, uh, and we're going to say, sure, it could say that. It could say other things as well, but sure, Alfred E. Newman. Okay, so that's Zodiac. Any questions on Zodiac so far? Because now I'm about to jump into Mary, Queen of Scots. Okay, and you'll be able to ask questions at the end as well. So Mary, Queen of Scots. So there's a few things that are kind of, I'm going to be jumping back and forth between different projects here. And one of the projects is a really cool project that started out of Sweden, and it's called the Decrypt Project. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a database of all of the encrypted manuscripts that are tucked into uh, libraries and in chests of, of uh, old clothing here and there and everything, whether it's been solved or whether it hasn't been solved, and get a major database of the whole thing and get the keys that decrypt these messages so that anyone, it's open from the public, can go in, can add a document, can add a key, or if they have a document, can go in and search and see maybe this key is already in this database. So this thing has been growing. It's a wonderful project. And every so often something will come in and the people who run the project will go, hmm, I think this code cracker over here would be really interested in this particular document. So, um, the, so I, as I said, the intent is the collection. And there are some of the best code breakers in the world are scanning this database all the time because they love cracking codes and they want to see is there's something new out there that they didn't know about that maybe they can go, you know, cut their teeth on. And there are others who track it to see, maybe I can bring this to the attention of someone who likes to crack things in French or Italian or German or something like that. So here are the hunters for this particular code here. We have three people, again, in different areas of the world. We have Satoshi Tomokio in Japan. He studied astrophysics. And as a hobby, he has this website called Cryptiana, where he posts pictures of European medieval coats. That's his hobby, is European medieval coats. And then there's uh, George Lazary of Israel, super famous code breaker. If someone posts on a blog somewhere, here's a code, and he's cracked it. <laughs> he pops up because he does these things really fast. And, um, and then there's also uh, Norbert Biermann in this case. I'll show you a picture of him. And he's a musician in Germany that was also involved with this. So um, so here we have Mary Queen of Scots, and some of you probably know all about her, and some of you maybe not, and so I'm going to kind of cover some uh, general stories about her. So Queen of Scots. Now, right now, today, 2024, we have the United Kingdom. Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, as is Wales and the Isle of Man and part of Ireland and so forth. Back in the 1500s, Scotland and England were very different countries. So if you had a queen of Scotland, you could have a queen of England, and these were very separate countries. So Mary was the daughter of King Henry V of Scotland, and also, and her mother was Mary de Guise. De Guise was a super powerful, uh, sort of think like Medici, like super powerful uh, family in the area. She was also related to Henry VIII and Henry VII. She was the great granddaughter of Henry VII. And she was the granddaughter of the sister of King Henry VIII. So coming back to Scotland, Henry, so we have two different lines of Henrys here, and everybody's named Mary, so it, it gets confusing, but I'll do my best here. So when Henry V of Scotland died, Mary became the Queen of Scotland when she was still a baby, and immediately multiple marriages are being proposed, uh, different uh, countries, different areas that want to marry her off to one of their sons, and um the one that was accepted was one in France to the Dauphin. The Dauphin in France is sort of like the Prince of Wales in England. The Dauphin is the person who is going to become the king. 
And so she was sent off to France when she was a child to be raised and educated. And she was very bright and she learned several languages, French and Italian and Latin and Greek and Spanish. And she was married to Le Dauphin, the heir to the throne of France, in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris in 1558. Francis did become king in 1559, but sadly died in 1560. It's still up to debate whether he died because he was poisoned or it was natural causes, um, but he did pass away. So she became the widowed queen of France at a very young age when she was still a teenager. Coincidentally, also in 1560, her mother passed away, married de Guise. And so at the age of 18, Mary returned to Scotland. So she's 18 years old. She's a widow. Um, also, she is she was raised as a Catholic. Now, this is a big deal at the time because King Henry VIII separating from the church and so he wants everyone to be protestants not everyone becoming protestant not everyone became a protestant at the same time so there's catholics against protestants and protestants against catholics and so when mary quaint came back she's an immediate threat to her cousin elizabeth the first who is a protestant because Mary, Queen of Scots, is also in the line of succession to become the Queen of England. So there's immediately some, some friction there. Also, there's often confusion about Mary, Queen of Scots, also known as Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, and another Mary, because they're all named Mary, Bloody Mary, who was Mary Tudor. Mary Tudor, different person, was the uh, half-sister, older half-sister of Elizabeth I. Um, and she was the Queen of England before Elizabeth I. So again, different people, all named Mary, but different people. Bloody Mary is not the same as Mary Queen of Scots. So Mary Queen of Scots is immediately a pawn in multiple power games. Everyone wants to marry her off. Um, and I won't go through all the details of all the betrothals and she married someone and she had a child, a, a boy, but she didn't like the person she married. And then he died in a particularly gruesome fashion. He was murdered. And then she married the guy that supposedly murdered her first husband. And it was, it was, really complicated mess. And so uh, when it all kind of settles out there, she was forced to abdicate in favor of her son. And then she went to England for help. She went to her cousin, Elizabeth I, and asked for help. And Elizabeth, about the best thing Elizabeth could do at the time was that she put Mary, Queen of Scots, in prison, or Mary, previous Queen of Scots, in prison. And she was moved from castle to castle to castle for about 19 years. And again, lots of plots. The plot that finally did her in was one that was organized by Elizabeth I's spy master, a guy named Walsingham. And Walsingham had a lot of double agents surrounding Mary, Queen of Scots. And uh, when Mary would send out a letter, and even if that letter was encrypted, that letter would often get funneled to one of Walsingham's agents very quickly and decrypted. And there were times where every single thing that Mary sent out, Walsingham was getting it, 100% of the correspondence that she was sending out. So with the Babington plot, it was someone that came to her, to Mary, offering to get rid of her opposition, meaning Elizabeth I. And when she replied to this letter, not knowing that everything was being read by Walsingham, Walsingham's agent actually added something to the bottom of Mary's letter that she had not written. Okay, so 
long story short, I'm not going to go into all the politics of here, but she was um, arrested and she was convicted and she was executed. And I think I just told you all that. Okay. So the codes, getting back to the crypto part of things, the codes tended to be these things called nomenclators. Nomenclators are a combination of substitution ciphers and like very small code books and homophonic ciphers all mixed in together. The letter, actually, I don't know if I can, yeah, I don't have a zoom, sorry. The letter on the right at the very bottom, you can see the part that was added by the encipher, the part that she did not actually write. Um, then that was by Thomas Philippe, who was the person who was doing the decryption. Sorry, next time I give this, I'll have that zoomed in. So Walsingham's uh, entrapment, he had actually created this table, the, the key table that was being used for Mary's codes at the time. And when she was sending out messages, she would, um, she would write them. She would have her own secretary who would then encrypt them. And then these letters would then be placed into a packet, which would then be placed into a beer barrel because it was a brewer that was smuggling the messages in and out of the castle where she was staying. All right. Um, Okay, so now we fast forward to these letters that are just a bit before the Babington side. So many of these letters had thought, been thought to have been completely lost. And then of our hunters here, one of them, Tomokio, Satoshi Tomokio, he likes looking through archives and he likes to go page by page through archives, looking for anything that is encrypted. And there are thousands of encrypted documents still out there. I found encrypted documents just because I happened to be stumbling through and, oh, look, here's another encrypted document. And these documents had been found in the French National Library and they were in the Italian section because they were sandwiched in between these Italian letters. So I think someone had assumed that you have this letter that's completely encrypted. It's just squiggles. So there's no from, to, date, nothing. It's just squiggles. And then you have a letter that's all in Italian. And then you have another letter that just squiggle, 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 and another letter in Italian. So the librarians evidently had assumed that this was a letter encrypted in Italian. And then here was the decrypted letter in Italian. And then here's another letter, the encrypted one, and then there's the decrypted part in Italian. But when uh, George Lazari and Satoshi and Norbert went through there, they're like, let's actually see what these encrypted letters say. And they tried decrypting them in Italian, and they weren't getting anything. They weren't getting anything. I'm like, hmm, this doesn't appear to actually be in Italian. So they said, well, it's in the French National Library. Maybe it's in French. So then they tried tugging at it and, and solving a code is like just tugging little strings here and there. And they started tugging at it with French and they started getting something. And then they realized that the French they were getting had nothing to do with the Italian letters, which is where these documents were also filed. And there were lots of these letters. There were 55 of these letters. And altogether, if you were to do a word count on these letters, you had over 50,000 words that were in these letters, all of which were encrypted with no indication of where they were from or where they were written or, or any of this. But then they found out like, okay, it's in French. And anyone here speak French or read French? I, I know we, we got a couple people. When someone writes in French and they're writing about themselves, it's a difference if they're masculine or feminine. So there's going to be a change to the ending of the word. So you can tell by the way it's written, whether it's been written by a man or written by a woman. So as they were decrypting, they're like, aha, these letters were written by a woman. And here's a woman writing in French about her son. And it's a woman writing in French about her son. And this woman is imprisoned. And click, 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 click. And they realized they were reading letters of Mary, Queen of Scots, that had been lost to history for hundreds of years. 
And so big surprise, super excited, but they also clamped down because they didn't want to tell anybody because they wanted to be really, really sure about what they had. And when they did more history research of what the letters said, and then they knew this thing about Walsingham and Walsingham, they knew that Walsingham had been reading all of Mary's letters for a certain period of time. And they thought, okay, well, if he read these letters, would these letters be in his archives? So they bounce over to the British side of the, the channel looking for the British National Archives for letters in Walsingham's papers that were letters that he had had stolen from Mary, Queen of Scots. And they found a few. And they looked at these letters and they found five or six letters that were a word for word match. So this was, again, an indication to them that it was Mary, Queen of Scots, and that they were on the right track. But they only had a word for word match on some of the letters, not on all of the letters. So they kept on decrypting and kept on decrypting. And they, I think I've told you all this. Yeah, they couldn't be decoded in Italian. Um, and they were able to work from the Walsingham stolen letters and the letters that they had and rebuild the encryption table for what had been used in order to encrypt those letters. So here's the three guys on the left. We have George Lazary from Israel. We have Norbert Biermann from France or from Germany. And we have Satoshi Tomokio from Japan who had studied astrophysics and then decided he wanted to have a hobby of European medieval manuscripts um, for whatever reason. So on the right here, this is the encryption table. It was, and, and I can go into great detail on here, but I, I don't, I don't want to bore you too much, but it was a really difficult table when they, wrote a program that could read the handwriting and then turn that into the digital letters that could be read by a computer. The problem they had is that some of the letters were followed by dots. And the dot was not a punctuation symbol, it was a way of modifying the letter. So if you had a C that had a dot on the right hand side, it meant one thing, and a C with a dot underneath it, it meant something different, and a C with a dot above it, it meant something different. And they needed to create a computer program that wouldn't just say, okay, this is a C, and have it as its own symbol. And then the dot would be its own symbol because then they would have lost the location of the dot in relation to it. So Again, a very difficult decryption project, but they did kind of figure it all out and they wrote a paper on it. And George had been like calling me up on the phone and sending me emails saying, hey, look, we're going to make a big announcement. We're big enough, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> so, and, and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever the announcement is, I won't tell anybody. And then bit by bit, it was coming out what he found. I'm like, oh, this, this is pretty cool. And he made the announcement on the anniversary of the date that she'd been executed. And it was, it was uh, I, I can't tell you the exact, something like, so what, 300, 400 years. And it then made international news. It was everywhere. There were at least 1,400 articles that appeared all over the world going, Mary, Queen of Scots, and articles, and we know more about her. And the uh, one of the Tudor experts looked at it and he said, this is the biggest discovery that's been made about Mary in over 100 years. So these letters, this new 30,000 uh, characters of source material is the kind of thing that researchers are going to be pouring into for decades, if not centuries from now. It's entirely new material about what Mary, Queen of Scots, was writing at the time. And she was very evidently a very intelligent person, spoke many languages. She kept as aware as she could about what was going on in European politics at the time. And so the things that she would be writing, she would generally be writing to the man who was the French ambassador to England at the time. And she'd be writing to him about, uh, stay in touch with these people, stay in touch with those people. Maybe we can send a gift over to this person and they'll, so they'll stay as our ally or maybe it'll at least kind of soften their intentions toward us in some way. And 
because she had every intent of becoming Queen of Scotland. And she'd abdicated, but then she had revoked her abdication, say, no, no, I didn't mean it. I'm not abdicated. And it all became, again, very complicated because her son was there. And what was her son's uh, status going to be now that she had revoked her abdication? And what it actually became as, as it all settled out is that she had told Queen Elizabeth that she was okay on staying imprisoned, provided that her son would become the heir to Queen Elizabeth. And that's what actually happened. So when Queen Elizabeth I passed, her heir became James I, who was the son of Queen Mary, Queen of Scots. So that's where it kind of started merging everything in there. Okay. And that's kind of it. Um, I can say as a summary, I can say that this whole thing of breaking historical ciphertexts, it's a super active field of research. New stuff is coming up all the time. And amateur cryptographers are out there, just like amateur astronomers are out there and finding comets and things. There's amateur cryptographers that are out there and finding documents all the time. And so they're in there and they're scouring through the archives. Uh, and there is this project called the Decode Project or the Decrypt Project, and it's trying to catalog these documents and as they come to light and catalog the keys so that if someone comes up with an encrypted document and they don't know how to decrypt it, well, maybe they can go into this project and find a key that someone else has either discovered or derived to then decrypt this new encrypted document that has popped up. And I hope I hope that makes sense. But there's still many old ciphertexts out there uh, remaining to be solved. So anybody out there that wants to get involved with these things, uh, the best academic journal is one called Cryptologia. And it is the academic journal for classical ciphers, historic ciphers, not the ciphers of like where you put your bank card into an ATM. That's, that's modern ciphers. That's a whole different area of research. But historical ciphers, you want to go look at Cryptologia. If you want to check out this Decrypt project, their URL is d-crypt.org. Uh, there's also a really good blog out of England by a man, brilliant man named Nick Pelling. And he loves uh, writing about historical ciphers. He loves debunking the uh, potential solutions that come up when someone says, oh, I've solved the Voynich. And then Nick will post a blog. No, you didn't. And he posts all the reasons why it doesn't work. Uh, and then Satoshi has a great blog out of, his, uh, out of Japan, which is called Kryptiana. And I recommend that one as well. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Come on up. We have a microphone. It's not like previous years where we had it in a box and you throw them the box. It's the first one. Huh? Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. I just had a quick question. Um, you said with some of the Zodiac ones that people think they might not ever be solved. What do you think? Because I feel like there's a world where maybe computers can run on that and spit out like, I don't know, 300 possible things and then you can do it, but maybe we're not there yet. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's something that I, I debate with people all the time. I'm on the side of, yes, I think it's solvable, especially because we know that his original systems used homophonic ciphers. So maybe those short ones use homophonic. Maybe they're similar homophonic to the others and we just haven't figured out the right way of twisting it or slicing and dicing it. Um, so yeah, I'm on the side that says it's solvable. Um, I was just wondering what is your favorite thing that you've decrypted? My favorite thing that I've decrypted? Um, hmm. Well, as part of a team, there's this thing called the Cyrillic projector, which is, uh, it was created by an artist named Jim Sanborn who also created a sculpture at the center of CIA headquarters called Kryptos. And in doing research about Sanborn, I learned about other sculptures that he'd created that also had codes on them. And one of them was the Cyrillic projector. 
And so I posted a bunch of information about it on my website. And then someone went by, the current location is at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And somebody went by and took a bunch of pictures of it. And they sent in the pictures and said, okay, well, let's transcribe the thing. And that was, okay, imagine you've got a big cylindrical sculpture, okay? And there's no Latin text in it. It's all Russian text. It's all Cyrillic text, right? And because there's a light in the middle of it that then projects out, so it's all Cyrillic text that's backwards on a cylindrical sculpture. <laughs> so, and, and I was getting a whole bunch of little, little rectangular images of it. So you can imagine me sitting down on the carpet with just these pictures all around me, trying to at least make a transcript of it. And I did, and then I, I posted the transcript on my website, and then two other people from the group came up and said, oh, we made transcripts too. And I'm like, great, thanks for telling me. Um, but uh, it was good because now we had three independent transcripts and we could compare them to make sure we had one super accurate one. And then uh, someone else came along and using our transcript made a decryption but he couldn't read what it said because it was in Russian. So then we're like, okay, so we have this decrypted Russian text, but it's all like mushed together with typos and things. And so then the race was kind of on to find a native Russian speaker who could figure out what it said. Um, and I found someone, because my dad used to be uh, in the Peace Corps and the World Bank, and so there was someone from one of the Russian speaking countries who was able to, and I said, can you call up Anatoly like right now and have him look at this? <laughs> and Anatoly was very kind and, and did it. And so then we posted the whole thing and it was, it was a big, a big news splash. So I definitely didn't do it alone, but I, I'd say that was one of the most fun ones that I did. What did it say? <laughs> um, it was two extracts from, uh, Russian documents. And one of them was the subject line of a Russian memo. And it was a secret Russian memo because we actually found the memo in another, another set of documents um, about concerns that a Soviet dissident was going to be speaking about something at a conference called the Pugwash Conference, some concerns that the Americans were going to use his comments for an anti-Soviet agenda. And so the KGB was wondering if they should take care of this guy before he went and spoke at the conference. And so that was one, one set. And the other set was, uh, it was information from a KGB training manual about how to develop sources and how for best results, you want to weave a psychological net around your source because then when you need information from them, you can pull that net tight. And because they're reliant on you, you can trust the information that you're getting from them. But then it also said, now this, this technique is generally not the way you want to be dealing with people on a daily basis. <laughs> but but for in terms of developing intelligence, that this is a very this is a very effective way. That, that's kind of an hour long talk smushed into a short paragraph. That's what it said. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, in terms of how they accomplished the codifying of their letters, uh, Queen of Scot, Mary, and uh, Zodiac Killer specifically, is this something they just had in their head, or did they have like a little? Little orphan nanny decoder pin that they use. Scott, I can't see him. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Say again. Like Mary, for example, did she write her letters and then codify them, or did she just have her code in her head right. and just freehanded it? I mean, how did that work? Oh, it's a, it's a great question, and thank you for for asking it. So, anyone that was in the nobility at the time was trained on these things from a very young age. She was. She had learned encryption at the age of nine. Okay, so uh, she knew how things were encrypted. These particular documents, she would write them. Her secretary would then uh, encrypt them, and then they would be sent out in this packet that would be hidden in the in the beer barrel. Right. Um, I like the idea that they would be able to to decode the uh, the Zodiac killer's messages, but. From what you've shown us, the problem is that it's such a short message. How can you verify? You're not you're not being able to say, okay, 
I know that this is the correct letter because it appears in all these different positions, that kind of a thing. So you're talking about the Z13 and yeah. the Z32? Yeah. Um, it, it would be very difficult to come up with a u unique solution for something that short. Absolutely. That's why I, I was uh, answering her that the only way that it could be verified is if there was some sort of, in my opinion, if there was some sort of overlap with one of the Z340 or the Z408. Like, okay, it, it was homophonic and these two letters also had three different possible homophonic characters. And so what's done with the 408 and the 340 was exactly what was done with the Z32 as well. And if I saw that, I'd be more inclined to think that it was a real solution. But you're right, with something that short, you could probably come up with multiple valid solutions and you wouldn't know which one was actually right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I will mention that I have some books here for $30. I take cash, Venmo, and PayPal. Um, other than that, I think this is the last session of DragonCon. So that's a wrap. Congratulations. <laughs>